Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fireside Chicago, where we host Fireside Chats with prominent leaders from Chicago's business community, live on Zoom with Q&A every Tuesday and Thursday at 11.30 a.m. Central Standard Time. I'm your host, Tim Shum. I'm also the founder and president of Lucas James Talent Partners, recruitment firm here in Chicago. Shout out to the Lucas James team, uh, mm -hmm. 32 team member team at home fighting the good fight on the personal and professional fronts. We have Mike McMahon, co-founder and managing partner of Jump Capital on with us today. I'm really looking forward to this conversation with Mike. He's got insights to a lot of different things that are going on in Chicago, coast to coast. So we're going to get to that in a second. Before we do, I just want to highlight some of the guests that we have coming on uh, in June. Uh, next Tuesday, we have Samara Mejia Hernandez, founding partner of Chingana Ventures. Uh, next Thursday, June 11th, Dr. Rahul Kairi, founder and CEO of Innovative Care. Uh, Dr. Kairi uh, started an urgent care facility in Lincoln Park several years ago. He's on the forefront of COVID testing. He has been living and breathing this thing on the ground. He's got some very, very, very interesting insights. Mike, I'm sure you'll be interested to, uh, to hear his insights as well. Um, don't miss that if you have any interest in what's going on in Chicago on the front lines of this thing. Uh, Michael Craftsman, co-founder and CEO of Urban Bound and Hierology and a rec uh, real estate investment company that he sold and a recruitment firm that he sold, Serial Entrepreneur, is going to be coming on June 16th. Uh, we have Matt Silver, uh, co-founder and CEO of Forager Logistics. Forager's doing some excellent things coming right out of the gate. They just raised some significant capital to tackle the problem of cross-border uh, logistics. It's a tech-enabled uh, brokerage firm. We're going to be talking to Matt about what his team his team is doing. Uh, June 23rd, John and Seth, CEO and president of IDX Technologies, is going to be coming on the show. IDX is the first FDA-approved uh, machine learning and AI diagnostic tool uh, to diagnose certain illnesses. Uh, first FDA AI diagnostic tool, the future of healthcare. These guys are on the forefront of that. They have some very interesting insights about what it's like to be going to a doctor in the next five or 10 years. Definitely check that one out for sure. We have another jam session, June 25th. Uh, we're going to be talking to heads of people of various organizations in Chicago, HR folks, talent acquisition, talent management folks, tune into that one for sure. Last but not least, Brent Sopel, June 30th. Brent is a former NHL professional, Chicago Blackhawk, former Stanley Cup champion. He's the current uh, CEO and founder of his own uh, nonprofit, the Brent Fo uh, Sobel Foundation, focusing on children with dyslexia. Tune into that for sure. Without further ado, we have Mike McMahon, co-founder and managing partner of Jump Capital on the show. Uh, Jump Capital is a Chicago-based VC firm that's invested in many well-known Chicago-based tech companies, uh, 4C Insights, Logic Gate, Brench, uh, Bench Prep, Upshow, Fast Radius, just to name a few, check out their site to check out their portfolio, uh, not to mention other uh, organizations on the coasts in, into Canada. Uh, prior to starting Jump Capital, Mike had 20 years of executive and financial leadership experience, rose the ranks through GE and GE Capital, which we'll get to today, president of Serva, as well as a independent strategic consultant and advisor to several organizations. Uh, Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for carving out some time for us today. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Tim. It's great, great to do this. It's a great idea. I, I love it and a great opportunity to interact with, uh, with some folks here and maybe share some of my perspectives on venture and some of the other things that we're gonna talk about. One thing I'm really glad that I am not following Brent Sopel. That's a good thing. You never, never like to follow the celebrity talent uh, being, a, <laughs> being, a, being a, a finance guy here, but, uh, Anyway, maybe I'll just start with a quick overview of, of Jump. That That's sounds good. Right. I, I know Love you got to. I'll keep it very tight here. Obviously, people know what venture is all about and and, and what we do. Um, and I think it's a really unique spot that we're in. We started Jump Capital eight years ago, and the thought was, oh dear God, we're not going to put another venture fund in play here. There's so much competition. There's so many venture funds scattered all over. But the opportunity that my co-founder and I, such shitness is my co-founder that we saw was unique in the Midwest, right? There was a real clear lack of financial capacity at the Series A. And so it was an interesting time too, where you saw lots of innovation blooming in these, what I'll call like other markets that weren't Silicon Valley, that wasn't Boston and New York. And so we were kind of studying that, Such was doing some interesting things. He and I worked together briefly at Serva uh, and we got together and said, I think there's an opportunity here um, to bring a fund to that Series A level and to do it in a different way. 
in our series a platform today we're a software investor we're investing kind of three to ten million dollars initially in a series a and taking like a 15 percent ownership in a software company we can go in deeper where do we invest in all that stuff for sure uh, but we want what i think is really important and what i want to convey here is we're like what's different about you you're not just a bunch a pool of capital there's lots of pools of capital but what we set out to do was we wanted to create something very unique. And how I would define that is that we, and I use this expression kind of almost cliche now when I talk to entrepreneurs, men, women that are leading these companies, I say, we're operators first, we're investors second. I'm a big believer in that. You need to bring something a lot more than capital to the table. And we do that. We have a team of 12 folks, all with different perspectives and different operating backgrounds. And we have a, a very high level engagement with our companies helping them really helping them and trying to differentiate who we are as investors. We've been at it this for, as I said, eight years. We've invested in 62 companies. We've exited 16 of them. Um, and that's the personality. That's kind of the ethos of who we are. We want to be known as a highly engaged operating team with an investment platform behind them. So that, that's kind of a quick overview of what, what's different about these guys for those who, who don't know uh, Jump Capital. Absolutely. And it, I listed a couple of the companies that uh, Jump is invested in, in Chicago. Uh, some of our clients uh, we've talked about are, um, you know, J Jump is involved in, you know, to a certain degree. So great name in Chicago, uh, very, very, very well respected. Um, let, let's talk about the philosophy that you have outside of the, hey, let's, let's stop doing what the coast need. Let's get at the series le A level operational. When, when you're um, talking to entrepreneurs, maybe let's start there. When you're mm -hmm. Uh, when you're screening entrepreneurs or opportunities, what, what specifically are you looking for in an entrepreneur or a team or an idea uh, to be able to uh, get, you know, consider yeah. a quality investment? I would tell you, I spend a lot of time, no, no, we, we're, we're obviously very deeply analytic and we're looking at the addressable market. We're looking at the revenue model. We look at a couple of things, the ability for the idea to scale. And that means all that stuff around it, obviously. But I will tell you the differentiator and I'll share a statistic, which is really many of the folks on the phone probably know this, but I'll share it. It's important. When you look at the venture space, this is such a high wire act and such a high risk proposition. Correlation Ventures has looked at 30,000 deals over a 10 year period and said all of them that had outcomes, venture stage deals, 66% of those deals will not return their basis, the original investment. So it's a high wire act, right? So we know two out of three, and I grew up with that. My, my family was in the restaurant business. My grandmother and grandfather, very successful entrepreneurs with restaurants and real estate. And they, she'd always drilled that in my head. Two out of three businesses fail. Two out of three businesses fail. She's 100% right, these early stage businesses. So it is high risk. One of the big risk differentiators is the leadership. And I know I've seen some of our companies, the ones that have, some have failed, some have done very well. I spent a lot of time on that leader and there's one factor in a leader there. There's several factors in a leader, but the thing that I look for one is humility. I like a leader who is self-aware he or she know, has had some success, had some failures and, and, and projects that humility and the ability to, to, to attract talent in an egoless way. We have several examples in our portfolio that just, I look at why they're successful. I was on a call yesterday with one of our very successful companies called Degreed which is an enterprise ed tech platform based in Salt Lake City and San Francisco. And I look around that table surrounding Chris and there are six CEOs there, all experts in their field, whether I'm the product leader, we have a brilliant woman running product, she's incredible. And that there's mutual respect and they're leaders and they have swim lanes and they have the authority to, to go. So we look for obviously scalable ideas and very strong compelling leadership teams that's, that is a differentiator for me. And then obviously we are defining segments that we want to invest in and things we don't want to invest in. Like we're an enterprise software investor primarily. We do have some consumer businesses, but we're not going to be out in a direct to consumer e-com business or so. we're not, that's, we know where to go and where not to go and where our kind of collective intellect as a team sits. We both came from multi-billion dollar organizations and I think it's fair to say, I don't want to put words in your mouth that, you know, you, you had learned a lot from that experience. I had learned a lot from that experience. I want to get into your background in, in a second. I don't want to deter from the, the track that we're on. 
uh, when you're when you're speaking to an investor or excuse me, an entrepreneur, and you look at their background, uh, let's talk about the difference between maybe an entrepreneur that maybe has zero to two to three or four years of uh, corporate experience versus someone that had saw a significant su success in a corporate environment prior to starting their businesses. Do you have any thoughts there? I'll make sure I understand the question. So when I look at an entrepreneur that had corporate kind of DNA previously. Yes. So maybe someone like yourself that had uh, 15, 20 years of experience at a company before starting a business, maybe 10 yeah. versus yeah. someone that, you know, started their business out of their mom's basement or in a college dorm room. I, I wouldn't differentiate between them. I think it really is situational. It's, it's the entrepreneur and the idea and the energy around the idea is really important. We've had many successful entrepreneurs that came from those backgrounds who took those learnings and how to scale businesses within those large enterprises and pulled an idea out and did it on their own. Um, so I've seen that. I've also seen the, the college dropout who's been able to power through an idea, get people and, and attract capital, obviously, is another part of that. So I have seen, I have seen both. Um, I know when we're looking at um, talent and we're bringing talent into our organizations, which we do a lot of, and we advise a lot on this, CFOs and leaders of all types, um, sometimes I've seen, sometimes the kind of the big company person, they're used to a lot of scale and resources and everything. And when you get into a Series A company, hey, guess what? you are the scale and the resources, here's your, here's your shovel. And you look for that kind of pragmatism in people like, no, hundred percent, I'm ready. I, I got it. I can do that versus like, wait a minute, don't I have someone that does that? So there's anytime we're looking at someone who might come from that profile to join one of our companies, you know, that, that we make sure that they have the right headset in terms of kind of the scrappiness that is required for a series A or series B company. So you and uh, your, your co-founder had started Jump in 2012. So, you know, there's, there's been eight years of, uh, you know, companies that you've invested in. You've kind of uh, provided that capital, that seed. You've helped them navigate certain scenarios. So you, you can, you've seen a couple different cycles of this. What is it that makes an organization uh, successful? That's a very loaded question. But in your experience, you know, there's got to be a lot of navigating. There's got to be a lot of adversity a lot of, uh, you know, hill, hills to climb. Uh, maybe pick out some of those uh, scenarios where entrepreneurs were successful. Um, so some of the attendees that are entrepreneurs can maybe take away from that. Yeah, for sure. One, one thing is inevitable. It's failure. It's inevitable. I don't care. There's no, there's no, and you've heard this obviously, but there's no straight line here. We don't have one company that we invested in that made its plan perfectly and track, not one of them out of 63 or so that we've invested in. So failure and modification. And that's why you look for in the leaders, the ability to adapt, right? To adapt. Okay. This didn't work out. I need to reset. I may need to reload. Bench prep is a great example of this. It's a phenomenal example of this, a local company here uh, in the uh, adaptive learning space that we're investors in and big investors. And in. I love it. That business started as a direct to consumer business. It ran out of capital and energy to keep scaling in that space. They, re they shrunk the business down dramatically, as you, as you were aware, and reset the business. We're going to go target B2B here. We're going to use the distribution channel of all the associations and certifying bodies. So Ashish and Ujwa are two smart, skilled leaders that were able to go, <clears throat> we're going to shift over here now and we're going to rebuild our business. And they've done it very well. The other thing that is important in that is your ability to attract capital. You have to attract talent and capital to your idea. And you have to acknowledge that you are going to go through cycles. There will be periods where it's going to be very difficult. The, the other thing that I think is important in the venture space is like a leader, like this whole relationship that we have with these entrepreneurs is unique. We need to make a value prop to the entrepreneur. It's not just, oh, here's our, our money and you go. And you, the entrepreneur, on the other side are thinking, I'm bringing this capital in because it's now time for me to accelerate my plans. I started with friends and family and angel funding. Now it's time to bring an institution in who's going to put $10 million in or whatever the number would be. And oh, by the way, I'm bringing that person to my table. They're going to sit at my kitchen table with me. And we're going to make decisions together, which is sometimes a shock to sort of like, wait a minute, I'm giving, I'm giving up control. And wait a minute, you, you have a say. And, and so it is really important to heavily weigh, and I tell entrepreneurs this all the time, a couple of things. 
really consider there's so much variety in types of investors and personalities and who is the investor within the brand that will be sitting on your, at your table. It's not like, oh, we have Andreessen, no problem. Let's live the, the greatest ever. It's like, wait a minute, who, who is the person? So who that person is sitting at the table and do not get solely enamored with valuation. That cannot be the sole, because you, you could pay for that dearly later. So broader context, make sure you bring the right party. There should be value created by bringing the two parties together. Um, so that'd be a couple of comments on that. Well said, well said. Now, you've been in the game since 2012, as, as I just mentioned. How have you seen the venture capital industry across America uh, develop uh, throughout that time and your experience? Yeah, it's been a boom cycle. I mean, right, you can you just go back to the collapse back in 2000 and to where we are today. It, and we're at the, arguably at that end of the, at the cycle. I mean, we've had a long, long run, right, where we're just posting record numbers in venture. And the amount of capital that's come to this sector has been amazing. New funds formed, et cetera. Valuations have spiked, all of that. So we've, we've seen all of that. I believe there's uh, a bit of realism now. Certainly there's a reset with the current uh, pandemic and, and which has, we'll talk about later, obviously there's some really unique opportunities in there and we're sifting through those. But yeah, I mean, I, I think it has brought a ton of capital. We were right, our thesis has proved right that we went to these underserved markets and these underserved markets are now becoming very interesting to some of the, what I'll call tier one funds that are out there and that they're looking now at, how competitive it is in Sand Hill Road in New York and Boston. And we, by the way, have deals in all of those markets. We, we haven't just said, oh, we're only in Midwest. We invest mm -hmm. broadly in Toronto and we have a couple of deals in Israel as well. Um, so hyper competitive. So you know that during that period of time with so much dollars chasing deals, it's hyper competitive. Um, and I think I believe that we're now kind of riding out when you adjust for some of the huge deals, we're riding out kind of the peak of the cycle, that's where, that's where we are. Valuations are being reset right now, they're coming down. Um, so that I think is a good thing. And uh, opportunities is emerging too. And I'll, we can get to that secondarily. Yeah, I got to imagine this is just a anecdote that I have in my head. More, more angel investors, you mentioned more capital. So more angel investors are going, hey, maybe I can, you know, kind of invest in this sector. Or I've seen a lot of micro VCs, you know, kind of pop up and there's, there's, there's just more firms out there. Uh, than there was five years ago, right? Um, and when you look at, I've looked at some statistics around, you know, how, how much are these funds actually returning to themselves and their investors over time? And uh, some are doing really well, some are doing okay, and, and, and some are doing so well. How, how do you think this situation with COVID might kind of yeah, impact, you know, some of those investors that just got in or just uh, dipped their toe in the water in the venture capital scene? It depends when they got in. Uh, I agree with you. There has been a proliferation of funds, big, small, all funds at all sizes. Um, it depends when they got in. If a lot of bets were just made in a small fund were made prior to this valuation reset, that could be problematic, right? Your you know, subsequent rounds of capital that are needed for these companies will be coming in maybe at a, at a down round or a flat round, a zombie round, as we call them. Um, so there, there, there will be a shakeout for sure. Um, like our, our approach during this time has been the very first thing was, okay, let's look at our companies and, and ensure liquidity runways are there. Um, let's augment leadership where we need to augment. Let's take the, the right actions now and assume that we're going to be in a cycle and we need, we need liquidity for 18 months. Um, so that, that's really important and our companies are in, in, for the most part in very good shape. We have a couple that are exposed to the sharp kind of correction. But yeah, to answer the question, I really think we will we'll see shake out um, particularly on the on the valuation side and their ability to continue to raise capital right because a lot a lot of these funds they'll raise their fund you need to prove returns to your institutional lp base to go raise the next fund um, so you have to be able to demonstrate that and the way you demonstrate that in the absence of a liquidity event is you have some sort of mark that occurs on the portfolio and you're able to demonstrate so but in the near term you're going to have a you know, those marks will not be where you want them to be if you're marketing for capital. So that'd be totally, that makes a lot of sense. Um, by the way, attendees that are live, if you have any questions for Mike, uh, make sure you put those in the Q&A section. We'll get to those at the end of the conversation. So Mike, you have an uh, interesting perspective. I wanted to ask you this. You're, you're in Chicago physically. 
uh, you're investing in Chicago pretty substantially if you look at the portfolio, um, but you also have access to the coasts and investments in the coast. How does Chicago stack up compared to Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, as it relates to the you know the venture capital cycle, the entrepreneurs, the businesses themselves, and maybe some of the demographics? It's getting so much better. When we started this, I mean, it was early days. And there was like, when you think about the ecosystem that has been established here. So it is getting better quickly. We're rising up the ranks of what's really important is to demonstrate exits, right? And we're starting, you could tick them off, right? There's been some big exits here um, and that's good. And what happens is exits breed entrepreneurs that come out of those exits. And what do they want to do? They want to plant more seeds and do it again. And I think that cycle is very important. That's what makes Silicon Valley so incredible, right? That, that cycle keeps turning. Now, there are other issues out there that a lot of those entrepreneurs may have been educated in the Midwest or a family in the Midwest, and they may make a decision to say, you know, I'm going to do that. And I, we, we see this all the time, people coming back to the Midwest uh, for lots of quality of life reasons, et cetera. So I think Chicago has made, in, in our eight years, incredible progress. I look around at the incubators, accelerators, all that kind of ecosystem that's been established, the proliferation of funds that have occurred in that time period. I think it's really, really exciting. Um, we know it's going to only get more competitive uh, for us. And that's why we, I, you know, I urge our team and, and to be, we're differentiated and we have to, we have to prove that value out. So it's been really, really good. I'm very excited about what's going on in Chicago. And when we started, I would tell you, when we started, a lot of our deals were not happening in Chicago. We chased the deals. You know, we got a deal in Boston, New York, we're Atlanta, you know, uh, some stuff in Salt Lake City, et cetera. And then we just started there, started to see, like, I started to see deals here that were starting to make sense. And I'd say about, I'm going from memory here, 28% or so of our portfolio is now Chicago. One thing is really, I would tell you early on in the evolution of our fund, one thing we didn't value enough. It's like, it is really hard. It's a very personal thing being a venture investor. You need to have deep personal relationships with the team. And it's so much better to be able to walk out of our building at 600 West with, you know, maybe two or three people from our team. And we jump in a car or whatever, lift or whatever, and, and head over to a meeting. And it's so much easier to do that, that philosophy. And I think we're really starting to see the, the benefit of that. And, and we're having a, a larger impact locally here. And we're climbing up, right? We started as nobody. No one knew who Jump Capital was when we started. It was like, what? Jump Capital was this little arm of Jump Trading, maybe. Jump Trading is our, our primary investors. We have others, but our primary investor. And we were kind of like, who are these guys? And we, Such and I have worked really hard to differentiate the message and also earn. You have to earn it. You have to bring value. Um, and we're, we continue to do that. We certainly have not accomplished that, but we are working hard at that. And our, now our reputation is building and the deal flow, people know like, hey, and this is what we want, by the way, like Such and I would both say this, like we want an entrepreneur who's considering that five to $10 million series A software in our sweet spots of the four verticals, which I'll talk about just briefly. We want them to say, you, you, we need jump capital. We want to have jump capital on our cap table. That's what I want versus, hey, let's just run a process and we'll talk to 40 and whoever kind of bubbles up. No, it's like, I want to pull through strategy. So you have to earn that, I guess is the point. But lots of great progress in Chicago. And we will continue to be a, a major presence in Chicago, um, particularly as kind of the sands are shifting a little bit. Um, you know, Pritzker Ventures is kind of de-emphasized a little bit right now. Mm -hmm. um, so it opens up a little bit of uh, space for us, I, I would say. Uh, we've co-invested. We, we love those guys. They're real smart men and women over there. But um, I think there's a real opportunity for us where we sit and the check sizes that we write and really who we are. Uh, I love hearing that, by the way. I'm sure the attendees, the future podcast listeners love hearing that. This is a Chicago-based show. We got to protect the house a little bit. Um, if, if we didn't have a technology scene dating back to 2012 when you started, uh, this situation with um, you know, the, the recession, the pandemic, the lockdown, could have been a lot worse. You know, a lot of good things, when I look at a macro sense, came out of everything that you're talking about. Um, Silicon Valley companies, and I, I have the recruiting lens, right? Silicon Valley companies would come to Chicago uh, and hire hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, 
right? Good for Silicon Valley, good for Chicago, good for Chicago employees, some of the sales reps, the HR uh, yeah. individuals, the operations folks, the CS folks. Um, but, you know, for, for someone from the, the recruiting lens, we need to continue that, right? We need to uh, keep these tech jobs here. There's a reason that when you look at the stock market, the NASDAQ bounced back a lot quicker than everything else and reached new highs. Everything's moving to the cloud. Everything's technology enabled. If we don't have technology in Chicago, specifically the, the next wave of technology companies, maybe it's AI, maybe it's machine learning, maybe it's something we haven't even come up with, with yet, but we gotta get that in Chicago. And everything that Mike, you're talking about or for the listeners that Mike's talking about um, is really important because there's been a lot of jobs that have been lost and the bounce back is a direct reflection of us building this technology scene in this technology community. So very, very well said there. Any other, uh, any other thoughts there? No, and I, I, I think we should. I think there's a lot of ground to take. I actually think Chicago should be much bigger in the tech scene. We have incredible university systems around us, right? Incredible, differentiated and distinguished university systems at University of Illinois in the fields that really support software and technology. Um, that's incredible. And you know, I think on the fintech side, this is a fintech center, and you, you would think we should be much bigger player here uh, than we are. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity. What I love about you know entrepreneurs and kind of people from the Midwest, there's a, and it really reflects kind of who we are too. There's a um, probably the wrong word, like a pragmatism. There's a blue collarness to them, a directness um, that we really like, and we look for that in, in people too. Just people who kind of get shit done and give me the shovel. Let's go to work. Let's build this thing together. You ha I, I don't want to overgeneralize. And some of these other joggery, sometimes it's, it feels like more helium than that it is kind of, uh, you know, sweat. So um, I love that about it. We love investing in the Midwest and all, and all these markets. Um, so that's what I'd say. That's very well said. Yeah. There, there's a, a, any time this topic comes up for me, there's always that Hey, we need to be we need to be investing more. We need to be investing more. But I think that kind of goes against the, the the pragmatism, the humility on the investing side of just you know investing in any idea you know kind of willy nilly. Where you know when you talk about Silicon Valley, there's been so much capital, there's been so much exits, there's been so much billions and dollars that are in the hands of individuals that can then dump that capital back into ideas. You're you're bound to get the next uh, Facebook you know, yeah. with, with that, with that thought process, but you know, how much are you burning? And is that, is that the way that we roll here in the Midwest? Maybe not. Um, very, very interesting thought process, but I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, uh, hopefully being part of, you know, continuing to build, uh, build out here in Chicago. Um, just a reminder guys, uh, Q and a for Mike, we got one in the queue. I'll ask that, um, ask that here in a second. So Mike, let's, let's talk about the future of, of VC. So, but one of my favorite documentaries is a documentary called Something Ventured. Uh, it's on HBO. It's basically a history. Have you seen it, by I the way? Not. Okay. It's on, on HBO. It's the history of venture capital. And they start the documentary and it's all the, you know, the Kleiner and, the, and everybody that's kind of a big name in, in venture. But they start with the semiconductor industry back in the 60s and the folks that invested. There's actually an individual out of New York invested in these semiconductor companies those sold, that was reinvested back into hardware software companies, those sold, then it was the mobile digital area era. Now we're kind of in that SaaS application kind of era. There's been a lot of successful exits. That's where you play quite a bit. Um, any thoughts on what's next? There, it, it, there's a lot of companies trying to solve problem A, B, C, X, Y, Z. And it's almost kind of getting to the point where if you're just a convenience play, uh, Things are pretty convenient right now. Yeah, right. You know, the, uh, how, how much more convenient are you? And is that buyer going to, or that consumer going to purchase your product versus something else? And is that interesting enough to a venture capital firm? So have you put any thought into, or what, what's, what's kind of uh, any insight that you can give us? Yeah, to, lots of thought. And I, I think no better way to frame it is the acute shock that happened here with this pandemic. So we, we believe like any technology and software that is going to accelerate digital transformation in a couple areas are going to have, have tremendous focus in the next five years. Like, for instance, we've been looking at, we're investors in retail technologies, e-com, in-store, et cetera. So I, I lead those efforts among other things on, on our team from a vertical staff standpoint. 
and we look at techno what's happened here to these businesses in this environment, but any technology that can accelerate the adoption of e-com, let's just say, really exciting. One I'll give you an example of, we're an investor in a company called TrueFit. TrueFit is a fit and attribute recommendation engine for consumers. You have a profile that follows you everywhere where you engage with e-com. So it is helping ease the conversion of you on an e-com site for footwear apparel and other things. That bit, the interest in that is going through the roof right now, uh, which is wonderful because you're a retailer, you know, your in-store profile is going to change. Your, the elimination of changing rooms has been discussed broadly and it is happening, not discussed, it is happening. And the plat, they're closing, they're shrinking their footprint, turning some of those locations more into logistics plays and the e-com site is becoming much more important. Just look at what's happening with walmart.com, with Shopify, Facebook shop, it's on. And so we look for technologies that can help accelerate digital transformation, retail tech being one of them. Another one is in the education space. And we, we're big believers here that the education process is really, really, really changing. Um, and I don't know what it'll mean. Some people have looked out and said, what does it mean for a university you know, down the road? I, too far for me to kind of think about that. But in the near term, there's no question. Content has proliferated everywhere. The delivery mechanisms are important. They're all digital, oh, by the way. Um, the, the training mechanisms, the networking mechanisms, all of that. So we're investors in a couple of companies. I mentioned the two degree and bench prep that are in, the, in that space, which were facilitating digital transformation. Healthcare is another great spot. We're not a healthcare investor. Um, we have some healthcare bets, but I'm not a healthcare investor. We know where to play, where not to play but telehealth would be a classic example of that. Yeah. We're also an investor in a, a, a online refractory, eye, here's a great example, right? An online refractory eye exam business called Visibly. And just think about that, the ability to renew your contact lens prescription, your glasses, your lenses, and to do that digitally is very, very powerful. And the FDA is really starting to think this is exciting. And so those digital, and it's, it's overused, but Digital transformation accelerants are of real interest to me um, in those three verticals that I mentioned. Spot on. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, um, Zoom's kicking butt. There's a reason for that. Um, I think companies that realized um, you can't get caught off guard uh, having, you know, technology on premise in the B2B sense. Um, all that stuff has to move through the cloud as soon as possible. And um, a lot of those companies are benefiting from that. Uh, you should check out the IDX uh, show. I can introduce you to those guys. FDA yeah. approved, um, you know, diagnostic tool. Yes, yeah, so some of those bigger opportunities might take a lot of capital. You know, they're attacking bigger problems, but um, sounds like that's the future for sure. Uh, Mike, we're going we're gonna to move to our Q&A segment. Uh, we have one, but I was actually, I saw what the question was and I was saving a little bit about your background uh, for this because I did want to make sure that we touched on yeah. your, your corporate Happy experience. Yeah. Uh, so Sabina Mir uh, asks, what's up, Sabina? Uh, how did your background, especially at G GE Capital, she's a former GE Capital alum too, oh, nice. uh, which is known for operational excellence, contribute or help in founding Jump and your success as a venture capitalist? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, when I look at it, I tell the story of kind of how w we created Jump Capital. Very, <laughs> very different path when I advise, and I've done this recently, advising kind of young people coming up and pursuing their career. Um, for me, it was all this additive experiences that happened in my, in my career. All throughout, I'm a financial person. All throughout my career, I've been doing deals. So the deal part of it, I got it, right? Um, the disciplined focus and the disciplined execution process and people, that's all that wonderful GE stuff. And I'm happy to amplify that in a minute because there's some very important um, imprinting that went on kind of in my DNA from those, from those days. Um, and I use that to this day, like every day I sit on our, our deal reviews and we're looking at stuff. It's funny, I still feel like a GE FMP, you know, which is a financial management program. It's an incredible training. The second part of that G experience for me was I saw so many things. There were 26 businesses there at GE Capital alone and 13 at the time when I was there, industrial businesses. 
And so you were always moving in to different business models and trying to understand them and help them and grow them. And you had a very prominent role as a CFO, and that's the, the role that I had there. So those experiences of quickly trying to understand a business model, add your financial discipline to it, deal orientation, all that stuff played naturally for me. And I had leadership roles, big leadership operating roles post GE. And all that kind of culminated to, you know, here I am, you know, it's been eight years, I'm 56 years old. That, that's when I kind of started my VC career, right? And it just feels right. It feels like it was the right time for all that because of the accumulation of those experiences, which is a very atypical way to get into venture. You know, we literally kind of came in through the side door, created our own fund, had an, <laughs> had an sure. idea, and we just did it with muscle. We said, we think we have something special. I don't know if it'll work or not work, but let's go for it. And that's kind of what Sachin and I built. And now, you know, that's where we are. So, yeah, we, we talked about when we, when we spoke uh, two, three weeks ago, um, Jack Walsh's book, uh, Winning, was one of like the first like business books that I picked up uh, when I entered the workforce. I don't know why I just had this thing like if someone's got that good of experience, like let me tap into that a little bit and have that rub off on me a little bit. So you, you lived that whole Jack Welsh methodology. And what I've learned about business is like, there's a lot of books written on business. There's a lot of playbooks out there and it's just hard to do. It's hard to execute. It's hard to influence people to get on the, get on the bus, uh, lock arms and, and, and just execute the playbook. Right. But GE had a, for sure had a great playbook. Can you, can you speak to your experience there and maybe even yeah. touch on a little bit about Jack? Uh, yeah. The incredible part of my career was, was going there. I started actually as a securities trader from Mellon bank. And then I went to GE capital, went in through their training program. Without question, Welsh is one of the most prolific leaders that we've seen in industry, period. Period. He, he just is. He goes into that pantheon for sure. And he was such a unique animal. And I, I was able to interact with him several times in my career, um, presenting to him and, and so forth. Tremendous respect. I've never seen someone that had that personality, that just that strength of character. And Welsh, so you know who he was. Welsh is a scrappy, tough kid from Boston, outside of Boston, Peabody, hockey player, grab you by the shirt kind of guy, talk to you directly. There was no ego or crap around him, which was incredible. That personality from the top of the organization permeated the entire 300,000 people, $100 billion of revenue across everyone. It was this, he always said speed, simplicity, and self-confidence was what he would say. And it was just, I, to this day, have, I, keep those attributes. I have embraced them. I embody them. I use them every day. And for me, it is just like that candor, that directness. And also the thing that's very, very important is just this focus on discipline and results. And there has to be. So that was the personality of GE. It was just that way. And man, it's a great place. If you're a highly competitive um, person who likes that and thrives in that environment, likes to get, you know, knock down and get back up. And that, that whole world really was exciting for me. I learned so much, all my development, all of it came from that period of time that I was there. And I was there from 1988 to 2004. That was my time there. And I saw so many different leaders, so many different businesses and just have such tremendous respect. I think he just passed away as we all know in March. And if you just saw the stream of fawning adulation from people that he influenced their lives, their styles. It was amazing. I, one day I was on it for two hours, just flowing through. And some people that I knew didn't really know him, knew they were part of the machine, but they were not close. And I wouldn't ever say that I was close. I interacted with him. Yes. But I was not as, you know, on his team directly or anything. <clears throat> they had such like, there was, it was a, so obvious to me how much influence that he had. And yeah, just prolific leader, loved the personality, and the whole company, GE, had that same personality. That's why it was so successful, period. That's why it was. And I think it, that changed, um, obviously, when he left and was at 2000, and Jeff took over. It was a different personality, a different direction for the company then. But man, Welsh was just, he was iconic. And I just loved, the one thing I liked about him so much is that it was so direct. There was no time to, to fill the room with smoke and pontificate and everything. He was just direct, 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 direct. 
and it was clear. And there's power and clarity, right? And leaders have to have that. Like, here's exactly what we need to do. Let's get it done. Did we make it? We missed it. Why? You know, rate your people. Here's good, bad, et cetera. So really, you know, incredible uh, leader. And, you know, he, he's cert- his voice is certainly missed. I'm jealous in a lot of senses. Uh, I had some very good leaders in my, in my career. Um, I, I always try to seek out mentors, seek out leaders, whether that be in person, a book. Uh, Fireside Chicago has turned into professional development for a lot of folks. So attendees, listeners out there, um, if you're interested in the, the GE story, Jack Welsh, what, what Mike is talking about, check out that book, Winning. If you do your research, it's incredible uh, what that individual is able to do and the consistency of which over a very, very long period of time and just a bunch of different areas of business. So Mike, I'm going to let you go. You've been so uh, thoughtful with your time. I really appreciate you carving out the time for, for me, for Chicago, for the listeners. Um, it's been very much appreciated. I know you have a lot going on with your portfolio. If somebody wanted to check out Jump Capital, uh, entrepreneur wanted to reach out, uh, how would you say that they can get it in in front of you. Yeah, the, the best thing, and I, thanks, I appreciate everyone's time too. Everybody's busy. Um, you know, we, we do spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time networking and networking with just people on, on people because we're always looking for people to join our companies, right? The ones that we've invested in. And also, you know, prospects where we're going to invest. So we encourage it. Feel free to just reach out to me, Mike at Jump Cap. Um, I always like to connect with people and learn about, you know, different things. So um, really appreciate it today. It was fun. Uh, Tim, thank you very much. That sounds good. Have a good rest of the week, Mike. Thank you so much.